welcome uh, everybody. So we are with uh, our mediation presentation uh, entitled Interrogating Conspiracism, Exploring the Motivations Behind the Academic Treatment of Conspiracy Theories with David Guignon. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Giada Ferrucci. I am a third year PhD student in media studies along with uh, David, and I'm gonna be uh, moderating the session. Before we begin, we acknowledge that the Anishina Beck, Odenoshanani, Leopi Wuka, and other Wanderan peoples whose traditional lands were gathered upon today. Uh, we would like to remind you that during this uh, digital session, uh, this uh, presentation will be recorded, and so we kindly ask you to keep yourself muted for the duration of the talk. We will have uh, around 30 minutes for the presentation, followed by 30 minutes of discussion and questions. If you wish to ask a question, for example, please use the function of raise your hand, and then we will call your name. <laughs> Otherwise, you can use a, a chat box. And without further ado, I would like uh, to introduce today's speaker. David, as I said, is a third year PhD student in media studies and is also host and creator of Theory and Philosophy, a YouTube channel and podcast dedicated to the distribution of ideas. His research focuses on a study and intersection of conspiracy theories and the truth. So David, the digital floor is all yours and thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to hear your presentation. Thank you, Jada. Thank you, Effie. And thank you, anyone else who helped to put this together. Um, if anyone saw the poster online, that was not me. That was Giada putting in her expertise into that. Um, and yeah, I have to really extend my thanks to them and extend my thanks, of course, to FIMS generally, to Tim, my supervisor. Uh, I'm recording or I'm doing this from my phone. So I have a pretty small screen. I can't see who else is here, uh, but I'd like to thank Allison Hearn as well, who's been a big help. Um, and yeah, so, you know, preparing for this, I was thinking whether or not I would just essentially read out uh, what might just turn out to be a kind of extended footnote in my uh, overall project. But I was worrying that it would be kind of decontextualized and that I should maybe take the time to situate it within the broader scope of what might ostensibly, ostensibly be my project, my, my dissertation. So I want to do that. I want to give you a little bit of a um, kind of a brief overview of what the project will be and how this fits within it before I lay out what this is or present what this is, because this is also kind of short. So it'll be a little bit of a, this is my effort to fill in some time. So roughly I'm looking at conspiracy theories, which is pretty, they're pretty topical, especially now. Well, that's what topical means, but they're pretty relevant now. Uh, but I, beginning at the beginning of my dissertation, look rather historically at the many manifestations or the many times that conspiracy theories have motivated some kind of political, social, or, you know, cultural change, uh, taking as a kind of like a case study, um, the exam examples from ancient Greece with, with Plato, moving from there to ancient Rome with um, Sallust, uh, from there to cases of like the Black Death and uh, the witch trials from there um, into revolutionary America. And the goal of that is to demonstrate the conspiracy theories for the most part, I can't speak on behalf of all these examples or of all the examples, uh, were a ways by which to galvanize and to strengthen a kind of uh, cohesive uh, group, group identity in the form of social institutions. Now they, assumed very many different forms in all of these different cases. For example, in the case of uh, Rome, Sallust was writing pretty vehemently against a fellow named Catiline, who he believed was an arbiter for licentiousness, an arbiter for uh, frivolity, uh, essentially posing a challenge to the sacred social order. So he mobilized a conspiracy theory to discredit Catiline in order to strengthen, at least ostensibly strengthen, the social order. Now, if we jump to today, we don't really get that uh, side of things in terms of conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories, for the most part today, appear to be mobilized, at least uh, I will say regul regulatively, that is how they appear, um, to be mobilized by individuals who feel like their individual liberties 
are being threatened. And they actually see institutions as being the threat instead of the conspiracy theory being a way to strengthen and to vitalize and revitalize uh, these institutions. So we see, and this really is the case most, um, I guess, most uh, specifically in America, uh, where you know these libertarian conspiracy theories demonstrate a fundamental reversal. And this is primarily due to the fact that for millennia, only the you know richest, most powerful people could be espousing these conspiracy theories and have their ideas extend throughout time. So they're the only real examples that we still have. But in any case, they do signal that conspiracy theories historically have not been a marginal thing. They haven't existed on the margins. In fact, they've often been used to galvanize a kind of institutional uh, mindset, you know, to maintain social, the social order and to discredit and disavow potential threats to that order. Now, what I'm going to look at today with, with this essay is how there are these scholars out there, and I'm going to be a little bit more polemical in the way that I'm talking about it today than uh, I would ever write. Um, but they kind of forget that conspiracy theories aren't fringe ideas, at least for the most part. They tend to think that conspiracy theories are just these, you know, marginalized things that have seeped into the social fabric and they present a problem because of that without recognizing that the social fabric, without recognizing that the social fabric is very much indebted to conspiracy theories for giving it a kind of um, possibility, at least historically. So I use this, what I'm gonna present falls into what would be my second chapter, exploring conspiracy theories today quite broadly uh, before moving into an F, like looking at specifically uh, the critical approaches to conspiracy theories and then from, the, from there trying to consider how uh, conspiracy theories shouldn't be evaluated in terms of their veracity, their possible truthfulness, but instead should be considered in terms of the locations from which they emanate and what that can necessarily mean for group solidarity and political uh, action if conspiracy theories, in short, can be used for good or if they can be uh, a tool for marginalized groups to call attention to, um, I guess, systemic forms of oppression that don't lend themselves to very easy analyses or don't necessarily lend themselves to um, you know, easy explanations. And that is chapters three, four, and five taking on, taking on that question. So yeah, I'll jump now into this after. I probably just made everything a little bit more confusing, but Anyways, so, and a lot of people are saying, which is the title of Nancy Rosenblum and Russell Muirhead's book, they wrestle with the circulation of conspiracy theories in the Twitter age. Specifically, they posit a fundamental transformation of conspiracy theories into conspiracism. So conspiracism for them are conspiracy theories without the theory. Now they take Donald Trump as their archetypal conspiracy, conspiracist, not conspiracy theorist, because of his incessant espousal of conspiracy theories without ev any evidence, without any data, without any kind of real analytical rigor. For example, when pressed on the legitimacy of his claim that, that then President Barack Obama was not born in the US, he merely attributed its proof to surreptitious figures that had quote unquote, incredible information about Obama's history. And we can, you know, if any of us look back at any of his interviews, we can find examples of this. What Donald Trump was saying was essentially that, oh, well, I have these people doing this stuff. Uh, you, can, you won't believe what they're finding, but he never actually presents data. Now that is for Rosenblum and Muirhead, an example of conspiracism because there's no evidence. It's just appealing to or uh, citing these kind of clandestine authorities on the matter that doesn't have any epistemic uh, credulity. It doesn't have any uh, legitimacy. So the deferral of responsibility to unnamed figures 
is a staple of conspiracism that does not depend upon the acquisition of data and statistics or, or facts, nor on the drawing of connections, it instead intensifies as a function of its circulation. So the more people that espouse it, the more likely that it will be taken as true, and therefore the more likely it will continue to spread. So it does, has nothing to do with its legitimacy or its uh, analytical rigor. It instead just gains traction just by it um, spreading through the Twitter sphere in this case. So Rosenblum and Weir had located this phenomenon squarely within the Twitter age, where tweets and retweets occur at a rate as yet unparalleled in human communication for the, to some extent. Now, in a few moments, the idea uh, the idea that deep state cabal of child predators can be become a piece of national news without credibility, as just one example. So such is potentiated by the speed of communication afforded by Twitter and other social media. Of course, Rosenblum and Muirhead trace its roots to a few decades ago when dark money began to flow into American politics, and that's a whole like thing in itself. But they are clear that Twitter and other social media marks conspiracism's uh, emergence, its, its genesis. And its speed allows conspiracism the benefit of perpetual transformations. Uh, layers can be added to the conspiracy theory turned conspiracism in such a way as to make validation and fact checking particularly difficult. They can then easily permeate like a miasma with little resistance, miasmic. Conspiracism is not only determined by the speed at which it's, it is transmitted, however. Rosenblum and Muirhead are clear that conspiracism is a decidedly conservative phenomenon. They write, and I quote, the partisan penumbra of the new conspiracism is indisputably conservative and Republican. And I, if I haven't been clear, we're really talking about this squarely within the United States. While those on the left are drawn to classic conspiracism, or conspiracy theory with the theory, or conspiracy theory with evidence, according to them. Additionally, they locate among conspiracists a, des a desire to overturn democratic institutions that are often responsible to maintain accountability, justice, and knowledge. So it is in conspiracism's interest, you know, and how they have their representatives within the Republican Party and the conservative wing of the American political spectrum. It is in conspiracism's interest to undermine these institutions. And so it makes an appropriate bedfellow with these conservatives who look upon such institutions with uh, disdain. And all of us are privy to the uh, many, for, for many years, the, the attacks against you know, liberal academic institutions for pushing a so-called you know, liberal bias. Uh, we've, I guarantee we've all heard some derivative of that complaint. So they conclude their book by drawing attention to the threat of conspiracism against legitimate epistemic sites of authority, like academia. In their words, and I quote, where the new conspiracism extinguishes common sense, there can be no argument or negotiation or compromise, all of which require some shared terrain of facts and a shared horizon of what it means to know something. Conspiracism comprises not only, sorry, conspiracism compromises not only what people can know, it undermines the very foundation of how people acquire legitimate information at all. This is essentially what Rosenblum and Muirhead argue over the course of their book. Now this was all just kind of brief summary of what their book was about. There is a little bit more to it, um, but I don't have time to give a whole big uh, plot summary here. Now I want to challenge what they claim on three broad fronts. Firstly, I want to engage with the raw data on Twitter users to show that they compromise a significant minority of the population. And within that population, a significantly smaller percentage of users actually tweet or retweet. And the, how these data problematize the apocalyptic vision that Muirhead and Rosenblum construct about the Twitter age and it fostering conspiracism. Secondly, I want to engage with the historical continuity of conspiracism to demonstrate that the phenomenon they are describing, just to recap, 
describing a situation in which conspiracy theories are put forward without the theory, ostensibly having no uh, you know, epistemic legitimacy, not using facts, data, anything like that, just using you know, non-evidence. Uh, I want to demonstrate that that has actually always been the case for conspiracy theories. And it's strange to me that they put forward this new idiom, this kind of critical way to look at conspiracy theories, when in fact, it seems like this has always been the case. So the, the risk I identify here is that by locating this problem squarely among conservatives, they fail to acknowledge that conspiracy theories permeate quite a lot also among uh, left-wing um, academics and politicians and intellectuals alike. And so we risk kind of uh, rendering ourselves or our view myopic if we don't consider this more holistically. That is, if we don't consider the ways that conspiracy theories sort of invade um, so many different echelons, so many different spheres of society. And finally, if we, for the sake of argument, accept their characterization, characterization of conspiracism, if we say, fine, there's been this fundamental transformation uh, of conspiracy theories into conspiracism, we've lost the theory, we've lost uh, proper argumentation, proper uh, use of evidence, we are still confronted, in my opinion, with another problem. And this is that for them, the issue of epistemic fidelity eclipses the other problems found in both conspiracy theories and conspiracism. Most notably, how conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists can often be, use conspiracy theories to promote pretty racist, sexist, xenophobic messages. And their, their project, when they, they almost valorize conspiracy theory proper because of its use of theory, it almost sounds like what they're trying to do is make conspiracy theories great again. Like they're almost, they're trying to harken back to a time that, uh, you know, I'm not totally sure was ever there, but it glosses over and kind of whitewashes conspiracy theories where when they say, oh, well, at least they had like this reputable epistemic or, or kind of legitimacy attached to them. By saying that, it sounds like they're, they're saying, oh, well, then they're better even though you know, historically we can see how these theories were, have been so often used at the expense of you know, marginalized communities, be they uh, the black population in the United States or the Jewish populations all over the world, these conspiracy theories are a very harmful thing. Okay, so number one, I ask, is conspiracism a threat? At least looking at it in terms of Twitter. So according to, a re, uh, sorry, according to a Pew Research Group study, only 22% of adult Americans use Twitter. And of this population, 10% are responsible for more than 80% of the tweets. So 90% of the people, 90% of the 22%, which is already pretty small, barely tweet at all. So additionally, they found in this study that Twitter users are younger, more educated, and more likely to be Democrats than the general public. So that means that fewer than 5% of the most active Twitter users are, could possibly be conspiracists because only 5% are most likely Republicans. Therefore, because they say that it is a, you know, a Republican phenomenon or conservative phenomenon, then therefore 5% or less actually fall into that camp. Now, this is not to say uh, that a minority of the population cannot have devastating effects on the, the social body as a whole. Like that, that would be very misguided to say. Instead, I wish to draw our attention to another seminal study in the field of conspiracy theory research by um, Uzinski and Parent, who found that upwards of 50% of the American public believe in at least one conspiracy theory. Now, this is in terms of the so-called classic conspiracy theory that uses theory that has, for Rosenblum and Muir, had some kind of uh, legitimacy to it. So these are the classic conspiracy theorists. And the prevalence of conspiracy theories has remained, according to the study, somewhat stagnant over the past 100 years. Just as a kind of an, an aside, that might seem a little strange to say that conspiracy theories 
have remained, at least their distribution there, the likelihood that people believe them have remained somewhat stagnant over the past 100 years because, you know, we think of the internet facilitating their distribution. It might seem totally erroneous to, to posit that, but apparently, um, according to their study at least, that doesn't seem to be the case. They, they seem to have been rather stagnant with their only, uh, them finding only spikes in conspiracy theory belief among the public sometime in the 60s, I believe, and sometime uh, just at the height of industrialization around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, but that's kind of a, an aside. So Uzinski and Parent, Uzinski and Parent found that pr the propensity for conspiracy theory belief was consistent across the political spectrum as well. And they extend this, the same applies to gender. Uh, it doesn't follow though with uh, economic status. Uh, I think that that was one of the markers that demonstrated some likelihood in uh, less belief in conspiracy theories, the higher your economic status, which of course dovetails with likelihood of having access to better education, perhaps, who knows, it might mean a, a whole slew of other things. So conspiracy theories, as they have historically manifested, not as the new conspiracism, appears a much more concerning phenomenon given the statistics than this new conspiracism, which we've identified seems to be, uh, you know, seem to permeate only among a minority of the population, not 50%, as Uzinski and Parent uh, identify. So the next, the next point that I kind of want to draw upon that I mentioned earlier is there kind of strange split between conspiracy theories and conspir conspiracism. So recall that conspiracism is conspiracy theory without the theory. It is simply propagated by word of mouth and accepted as true, not by the strength of the argument or the facts presented, but simply by its circulation, such as apparently facilitated by social media. However, I, I ask of you, the listeners, when you think of a conspiracy theorist, do you, th in the classic sense, like the person for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, 40 years, if we've been thinking about conspiracy theories at all and conspiracy theorists way before the Twitter age, way before conspiracism, when you were th would think of a conspiracy theorist, would you be thinking of someone perhaps in like a basement, like um, uh, Oliver Stone style with uh, Kevin Costner and with a, with a cork board and like, with pins and little pieces of yarn connected to one another, with drawing connections between different figures and families and all that, or like, uh, like in True Detective when the Rust Cole presents his his crazy uh, uh, cork board with that. Do we think of someone doing that? That kind of rigorous theory and analytic um, demonstration of a conspiracy, or do we think of that one weird uncle? who just seems to have this reservoir of unsubstantiated facts that they just pull from God knows where to just say whatever they want. And I tend to think it's probably the latter, but that person is not using these, you know, these theoretical arguments to demonstrate their point. They're just dropping facts. And at least this is stubbornly anecdotal on my part, but that is, has only been my experience just being uh, inundated with unsubstantiated ideas that seem to have no attachment to reality and seem to, in many ways, that be directed against institutions. So I, if you're more familiar with that uncle example, then great, we're on the same page. If not, I'd love to hear you uh, expound upon that more when we get the chance to discuss or in the Q&A. So conspiracy theorists have historically, in my opinion, been more passive recipients to deceptive information than active participants within this thing called theory, like doing conspiracy theory. They just seem to be people who, like sponges, taking in this information that they may have heard from someone or read somewhere or today, you know, saw on the internet that they internalize, they take it in, and then they just regurgitate it later. So the silent ma ma majorities are really what keep the wheels of conspiracy theories moving, not because they were actively engaging in the ri rigorous detective work that Rosenblum and Muirhead imply of the conspiracy theorist proper, the person that connects the dots and compiles evidence, they say, 
but because they once heard something that seduced them by its fantastical appeal. So as much as adduced by the startling numbers already presented about the ubiquity of, of belief in conspiracy theories, that is 50% of people believe in at least one or at least know someone who does, where the vast majority of these people have never drawn their own connections or participated in the theory of conspiracy theory. But that doesn't mean, uh, or that means then that we must have had conspiracism this whole time to some extent. And it is my contention that we don't need this term called conspiracism. We can just stick with the fact that we have conspiracy theories. However, okay, if we accept that the new conspiracism marks a qualitative shift or transformation of the conspiracy theory, that is, we accept what Rosenblum and Muirhead are saying, let us take their example, their, their uh, archetypal example that is Donald Trump as our case study here and his use of the birther conspiracy theory. And if someone happens to not be familiar with that, that is the conspiracy theory perpetuated most notably by Donald Trump that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, that he was born God knows somewhere else. Uh, and that would then make him uh, an unworthy contender for the presidency. And this is a conspiracy theory that he has, he was very much uh, pushing for many, many years, um, just up until he ran for, as he was running for the 2016 presidency, I believe, but around that point is when he renounced it. But for many years before then, he believed that Barack Obama was not born in the United States. So Rosenblum and Muirhead's use of Donald Trump's birther conspiracy theory as an example of conspiracism fails to acknowledge that Trump did not simply credit anonymous people for putting forward this idea. For example, on May 29th, 2012, in an interview with CNN's Wolf Blitzer, he argued that, and I quote, Obama's mother was not in the hospital at the time of Obama's birth. Now, more than a year later, on December 12th, 2013, he tweeted, quote, how amazing the state health detector who verified copies of Obama's birth certificate died in plane crash today. All others lived. And finally, uh, another passage or another uh, piece of evidence. A year later on September 6, 2014, he tweeted, and I quote, attention all hackers, please hack Obama's college records, destroyed question mark, and check place of birth. These examples of Reduce or demonstrate Trump's proximity to the conspiracy theory proper, not to conspiracism as Rosenblum and Weir had suggest. That is, he's using evidence, at least, or trying to compile these, this evidence or putting, connecting these dots that give him this, I guess, this kind of um, legitimacy that Weirhead and Rosenblum fail to acknowledge. And there's a risk to that because they completely disavow how these structures that use supposedly legitimate uh, forms of uh, inquiry are themselves, can be themselves extremely problematic. And just because they use these proper forms doesn't mean that they're somehow impervious to uh, these kind of violent beliefs. So he, in these examples, Donald Trump is connecting the ostensible dots to form this narrative, a marker of the conspiracy theory. So Trump is only the tip of the iceberg for this phenomenon, however. In recounting the trajectory of the birther conspiracy theory, Benjamin R. Warner and Ryan Neville Shepard reveal that it is much, resembles much more conspiracy theory proper than this new conspiracism. They write, and this is a long quote here, they write, the birther conspiracy theory formally began when supporters of Hillary Clinton circulated an anonymous email in the final months of the 2008 Democratic primary, suggesting that Obama was born in Kenya. By June 2008, other versions of the narrative suggested that Obama was born in the United States, but ineligible for automatic citizenship due to the strict immigration laws at the time, or that he accidentally forfeited his U.S. citizenship when his family moved to Indonesia while he was a young boy. So it appears that, now this is back to my words, so it appears that the birther conspiracism was still connecting these dots using theory. However, if we ignore the evidence I just presented, 
as Rosenblum and Muirhead do, they don't cite these examples in their book, um, conspiracism of birtherism mimics the traditional connect the dots attribute of conspiracy theory proper in another significant way. And that is that for the American political racism machine, Obama's blackness in this case that Donald Trump is drawing attention to when he's saying that Obama was not born in the United States, Obama's blackness is essentially a dot that is connected to the believed anti-American principles of his economic and social polity, policies, which can then be connected to his foreignness, which is then connected to his uh, you know, Marxist agenda, which is then connected to you know, so on and so forth. So Muirhead and Rosenblum suggestion that conspiracism is conspiracy theory without theory is essentially contingent upon a selective recognition of what counts as evidence within theory or of a theory. When Donald Trump claims that Obama is not American, he is not drawing upon an abstract, disconnected, perhaps transcendent explanation that was born of an ephemeral Twitter sphere he is doing exactly what conspiracy theorists have been doing in America since its inception, that is drawing attention to otherness as being a marker of anti-Americanness. Without acknowledging these markers of race and foreignness that are endemic to the American uh, imagination and that Donald Trump certainly embodies to um, an extreme degree, Muirhead and Rosenblum participate in a fundamental erasure of the machinations of the American political system, one that when working perfectly, that is, you know, they're using the right epistemic authority, uh, the right approaches, you know, they're using this Socratic method, whatever you want to call it, um, is predisposed to racist attacks against people of color in this case, and this of course extends to uh, many other people. We're not even bringing up the problem of like the um, treatment of non-normative forms of knowledge production that are just outright disavowed and that for some people they they are anyways i won't get into that so they don't they don't need in my opinion to put forward their complicated theory of conspiracism to make sense of birtherism that conspiracy theory the beliefs that made it possible are and have for for centuries been endemic to american political life and the conspiracy theories within it when approaching the phenomenon of conspiracy theories today, it is, I believe, best to consider them as an expression of conspiracy theories as they have historically manifested rather than as something new. So I believe that their, uh, Rosenblum and Muirhead's valorization of the traditional conspiracy theory as being more, almost more desirable, like being more legitimate for its use of theory fails to acknowledge the way such theories have been used to justify some of the world's most significant atrocities and the way that conspiracism is still blatantly tethered to such a method. So one such example is that when George Bush was uh, essentially riding on the conspiracy theory that Iran had these uh, weapons of mass destruction, it resulted in the deaths of innumerable uh, Iraqi and Afghanistan uh, people, civilians losing their lives, which to me seems to be a lot more devastating than Donald Trump tweeting about um, liberal bias in academia, but that's, I'm not hierarchi hierarchizing these things, or maybe I am, but uh, it's hard to, for me to really acknowledge this as being something that demands this kind of attention, especially when it seems to be resting on such intractable ground. It seems to be kind of flimsy. So their project speaks to essentially, um, it reads like an effort to revitalize these legitimate sites of authority for their implicit attachment to so-called legitimate theoretical inquiry and in doing so directly target the most conservative efforts to discredit like in this case academia so while important given much of the rhetoric surrounding cutting funding to like for example that the kind of rhetoric we're hearing coming out of the united states and in canada too cutting funding to uh, certain departments that have anything to do with like critical race theory or, you know, gender studies or, or any of these uh, departments that are often, you know, targeted in the US right now. Uh, what Rosenblum and Muirhead are doing are inadvertently participating in the same epistemic appreciation of one form of theoretical speculation over others, this kind of theory that they're lionizing. And they 
fundamentally reveal their complicity in the broader system of exclusion that has repeatedly disavowed so-called non-legitimate modes of knowledge production in the US and elsewhere. So that's that's pretty much it. That's that's it. I don't want to keep rambling on here. Uh, but yeah, thank you for listening. This is very strange. <laughs> I'm missed. Thank you so much, David. Yes, it's the new normal. So I think we are ready to accept some questions actually from this very large audience. So if you can raise your hand and then ask uh, your question directly to David to keep it more interactive, that would be great. I'm I'm on a pretty small I'm on my phone so I can't actually see all of your faces at once so would either Giada or someone else who might be on like a, a computer be able to tell me like tell the person that they can unmute themselves <laughs> do, do, do that that arduous work for me yeah I think um Percy has his hand up Percy why don't you take the floor yeah, thanks, David. What a tour de force, mate. Well done. Thanks, Percy. So I understand your suggestion that um, conspiracy theories are a perennial issue and aren't new. But in the context of mis and disinformation and espionage campaigns that try to sort of manipulate divisions in public opinion and debate, can anything be said about the novelty of new conspiracy theories? So in other words, is there anything new about the modus operandi of conspiracy theories in the digital environment? Yeah, well, there's, there's this one pretty uh, quote that stuck with me that I can't remember where I read it, but uh, it went something along the lines of this, that in order for misinformation to be effective, it needs to be 95% true. And there's some truth to that in that um, if something is just outright false, you know, we, we might be want to think that it would be immediately excluded from any consideration. Um, but, you know, people, I think, tend to be more uh, seduced by things that have some kind of um, legitimate, some degree of legitimacy attached to them. I don't know if it's 95% true or 80%, that's an impossible thing to quantify. But what I think to answer your question in relation to today is that the internet, I think, has not only allowed just the, the distribution of more misinformation, but it has facilitated the use of what is culturally accepted and often believed to be legitimate forms of um, knowledge production to be co-opted in the service of misinformation, which I think might be new, even though it has its roots uh, a few hundred years ago for me. So to give you an example, um, I, I look at in, in, there's one section I, I look at in my work in the case of the distinction between the treatment of, in, in the case of the, the witch trials that was the genocide of, of women that is so, so often gets ignored where there are these two figures in that field, or in that field, just call that field, two figures who were trying to justify, or one of them was trying to justify uh, the witch trials while, while the other was trying to uh, discredit it. And the one that was trying to discredit the witch trials was doing so with religion. He was using religion to say that humans don't have a right to condemn other people, the witch trials should not be occurring be through like humans essentially because we're we're you know flesh and bone we aren't god um whereas this other guy who is trying to justify the conspiracy uh, the, essentially the conspiracy theory that women were working with satan uh it's kind of that's a whole other thing uh but who were trying to justify the witch trials he was using the emerging uh lexicon coming out of like um surgical knowledge at the time. So this is, uh, I think, in the early 17th century, I think, was this particular guy. Um, the kind of surgical knowledge that was coming out at the time, mobilizing that rhetoric for the purpose of justifying the treatment of women, like as being witches. 
And I think that we see that certainly where people can so easily adopt a kind of so-called scientific vernacular to justify their misinformation, which has been facilitated. Like you don't have to go and read a book to have that and to give yourself that legitimacy, which I think certainly helps the spread of these um, ideas, even if these ideas aren't maybe spreading, like I don't know how to quantify if they're necessarily spreading more, but the way by which they can be justified is certainly facilitated with these, you know, the co-option, co-option? By co-opting these other so-called legitimate, you know, these more legitimate sites, these more legitimate forms. That's my opinion. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Perfect. Uh, Zach, do you want to go next with your question? Yeah. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know who you are. Oh, Zach. Um, hey. Yeah. Okay. I have to scroll through and see who's actually talking. Okay. You, pr you probably don't want to see it. Anyway, it's okay. Um, so I think a lot, of, as like you know, I'm kind of been kind of fascinated by conspiracies in the last little while. Um, because I'm kind of teaching a course on fake news. And so I've been reading a lot of stuff on um, conspiracy. And so I have, um, one of the things I was wondering while you were talking was you kind of made a connection to religion in your, your answer to Percy. And so one of the things I was wondering is like the way you kind of describe conspiracy, it sounds very similar to the way people often describe something like religion as this kind of unifying force that's used to kind of galvanize people for um, some sort of group solidarity or as a way of kind of understanding or a worldview through which to understand the world. And so I was wondering is, you know, is there, and, and if you've ever read like Karen Armstrong's history of different religions, they often, she presents them in, in very similar terms where it's like, they're often political tools used by different leaders as a way to kind of galvanize some sort of group solidarity in the face of some sort of opposition. And so I was wondering, you know, when we think about something like conspiracy, is there a connection between, say, conspiracy and religion in terms of how they function and how they rely on very similar ideas about, um, you know, how we should see the world and kind of the overarching sense of unity that might explain the, why the world is the way that it is. And so many of the conspiracies that exist seem to be kind of like operating in that same kind of level, right? Where there's a, there's governmental actors who are working for us or against us. And, you know, it, it seems like when we look at a lot of conspiracies, like you mentioned the witch trials, but also if we look at a lot of kind of the modern conspiracies that are spreading, is there kind of like, it seems like a lot of them are kind of tied with religion in some way, especially like things such as Donald Trump, um, uh, cultural Marxism and the way it's kind of talked about almost like as a weird conspiracy. Um, and, and, you know, uh, you know, I've been going into deep, different deep dives on like QAnon and I've been finding like how QAnon is often emerging with some sort of religious community as, a, as well. And I actually found like a YouTube channel of a church that actually just preaches QAnon verses and ties them into the, into the Bible. So, you know, it's, it's, there seems to be some sort of like connection between um, conspiracy and religion in terms of how they maybe see the world. And I was just wondering if there is any sort of discussion or do you see some sort of relationship to that? Yeah, for sure. And there's one article I'll, I'll just tell you the name of, and it will probably answer, <laughs> like you'll be drawn to it. It's called God is the Ultimate Conspiracy Theory by Brian Keeley. And Brian Keeley is a guy that certainly falls into uh, conspiracy theory scholar uh, camp. He's a pretty big figure there, um, taking a philosophical look at, at conspiracy theories. But I, I see something very similar in the way that um, conspiracy theories and religion use discourse to uh, develop a kind of um, group identity. And one of the things I might argue in the dissertation, but it might I might actually cut it out, in, you know, it's a kill your darlings type thing, um, is that 
I go so far as to maybe speculate that the earliest state formations were catalyzed by uh, a looming threat of a, of a conspiracy by other possibly uh, emerging sedentary tribes, which have some strange uh, correlatives within the present scholarship on conspiracy theories as a tool for uh, galvanizing groups. And I just, I read, I was reading this stuff and then I looked, just thought, well, why don't we think about this 10,000 years ago when, you know, these earliest states were forming and it might be that, you know, that people were forming these early states because they believed wholeheartedly that there were these people on the horizon uh, kind of knocking at the gates or, you know, existing right, right beyond the horizon and presenting this kind of threat. Now, in terms of the way that uh, this possible connection between religion and conspiracy theories, um, I would say that it's, in my opinion, conspiracy theories antedate or they, um, they come before religion, which might seem to be a, not a great thing to say, because I don't know how religion could happen. At least I'm just thinking about this in the, in the Christian sense, because the Bible is riddled with conspiracy theories. Uh, I'm reading it now just for fun. And it's, 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 it's just riddled with these strange fears by God himself. I mean, when, when God cast out um, Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, he sets up this, uh, this cherubim on the, one of the, on the eastern side of the Garden of Eden or something with this flaming sword. And I'm reading this. I'm like, what, what does he think is going to happen? Like, what does he think that Adam and Eve are going to come back? like he's God, like what is the, what is the threat here? Like, so, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go where I want to. At the end of the phenomenology of spirit, uh, Hegel talks about religion and what he argues is that there's almost like a need for, um, for something outside of ourselves. So in this whole book, Hegel is essentially setting up what it means to be a self and I'm really paraphrasing here, I'll be going very basic, uh, a self among other selves, and how uh, in this selfness, that is in this separateness, we can actually form a totalizing whole, which might, is for him, uh, a kind of way to arrive at um, a, a healthy, holistic kind of social, political, religious um, framework. But then he says, that's not enough. What you need is a thing kind of exterior as a kind of um, aspirational point of, of possible comparison that can never be attained. And it's kind of like if you've read Watchmen, the, you know, the, the or, you know, if you've seen the movie, when Dr. Manhattan is um, kind of scapegoated for destroying Earth, essentially, it brings the world together because they suddenly have this transcendent thing that is beyond them that they could never really challenge, uh, essentially bringing them to their knees, which isn't something I advocate for, absolutely not. But conspiracy theories are in many the same way, that thing, because of its imaginative, um, the, the kind of imaginative gusto behind it, it always posits a very fantastical enemy, right? And that motivates like a kind of um, a necessity for uh, group formation in order to anticipate that enemy. And in revolutionary America, what actually happened was you had um, these, you know, Puritans, these, these colonizers who were afraid of Popish uh, and Catholic influence. So they actually started to form these, these cults essentially within the Americas to maintain a kind of social order because they feared that there were these, you know, uh, secret plotters everywhere. So they needed to form these kind of um, uh, insular organizations that wouldn't be threatened by these outside sources. So I see, yeah, that in my opinion, the conspiracy theory and religion serve a very similar function in terms of motivating a kind of group um, solidarity because of they're both constructing an exterior, an exteriority that is greater than them and their need then to form something somewhat greater than the sum of their parts to possibly defend against that. My rambling ass answer. 
Um, could I reply to that, or, or is there anyone else? Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, while you were talking, I was also thinking of like, um, in your kind of discussion of religion, I was thinking of uh, Freud's book on Moses, which I think uh, he describes it in very similar terms where Moses kind of invented this kind of, um, this complex, the savior complex as a way of defending himself from others. And, and I don't know, but, but I was also thinking like, I think we, I think I emailed to you before about that book, The Resonance of Unseen Things. Um, you may have, yeah. Um, but it, it was also interesting because it's um, it's it's dealing with a bunch of interviews with um, people who kind of believe that they were kidnapped by aliens and probed, which presumably didn't um, presumably didn't happen. Um, but that like it's this kind of way this almost like in many ways it, it resembles something like a religion or this way of explaining some sort of social context in which these people feel like they have very little power or they are poor for particular reasons or that there's some reason that they are the way they are which is you know very similar to the way that religion could operate in that it helps give a an order to the world as well so it like um, it doesn't just kind of bring cohesion, but also provides some sort of like sense of comprehension of something that is, or a, of a world that is also so much vaster and so much more indifferent to humanity than people have an ability to kind of uh, conceptualize. And in many ways, that seems kind of similar to like your discussion of Hegel, where it's like you need some something because the world is so dark without it. And that can be some sort of sense of um, connection that can bring some unity, even if like logically many of those people know it does, it's not true. It provides some sort of like um, explanation for the way, the way things are the way they are. I couldn't have said it better. That's, that's great. <laughs> Fantastic. I think we have a, another question, probably the last one uh, from Joshua, if you want to go ahead, please. Hi, sorry, this is a really quick question. Um, is there a distinction between like uh, conspiracy theories that are imposed from authority and conspiracy theories that form like organically from like a mass? I, I don't know. I, I can't uh, think of an example of that or, or, or a distinction of that in my, off the top of my head. It's interesting though. I, I, could you give an example maybe in your, in, um, in yeah, well, like you said about how Trump was pushing the birth of conspiracy about Obama versus let's say, um, well, I don't know if we'd consider this like forming from a mass, but uh, let's say QAnon um it's 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 not directly imposed from a figure of authority right it's it's more so it forms out of like uh uh sharing on social media like you were pointing out earlier so i was wondering if you thought there is a distinction between the two forms or if it's too complex to say either way um if it's too complex it's too complex for my small brain uh not because it's necessarily too complex for someone someone who, who might know more about this than me but just to say something briefly to that um i think that the distinction in order for that to be uh drawn out would need to be a little bit uh clearer because how do we necessarily discern at least today between you know these authority figures um and you know the general public and i'm just thinking of like post Herbert Marcuse, when he was, you know, in the 60s, kind of setting up the template that um, masters or, or um, uh, rulers and, uh, and, and common folk will be indistinguishable on like television, where we can all we can all have our, you know, five minutes of fame, especially how this is facilitated with YouTube and, and other other kind of social media. So I think it would, there would need to be more uh, drawn out in terms of how we uh, define these these two separate poles, um, but I think that I think that that's super interesting. And if I think of anything, I'll 
I don't know how to contact you, but I'll no, find fair. a way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have one last question from Professor Streeter, actually, which I'll read uh, out for you because, David, you are on your phone, so you cannot really see properly the chat. How does the literature distinguish between full on conspiracy theories and more routine broken explanations for things in the absence of better information? For example, the corporate university is widely get a raise. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, uh, Dr. Streeter, that's a fantastic question. Um, and there would be a very long conversation, but it really depends. And a lot of the literature in conspiracy theory research just disavows defining what a conspiracy theory is because it's a hard thing to define. I mean, it's something, it's kind of ineffable. Like it's something that if we're confronted with it, we can, we can identify it and we, we know it. We're like, oh, that, that's, oh, it's a conspiracy theory. You know, you're talking about vaccines or something like 9-11 or something like we know that that's a conspiracy theory. But when we get into the kind of nitty gritty of it, if we separate these two terms, uh, the term that is conspiracy and theory, what we are presented with is a pretty innocuous thing. So one, one philosopher in the field, MRX Dentith is their name, um, chooses to have as broad a definition as possible. So the example that they give is like, if I were to, um, I guess if I were to realize that two or more people were organizing a, a surprise birthday party for me, and I were to, you know, say, uh, to, to a buddy of mine, like, I think that these people are plotting this, this birthday party for me, like, should I act surprised, like, even though, or, you know, whatever, um, that for them, MR Dentith, is an example of a conspiracy theory, if we just use the most basic possible definition, but that's not what a conspiracy theory is, like, we, we don't accept that, like, at least not in our, like, day-to-day, -day. no one would call that a conspiracy theory, so we have to also account for these kind of uh, social, um, the kind of social implications and the cultural codes and, you know, the mythos that define what a conspiracy theory is. And for that, you know, without rambling on and on and on, there's um, a guy by the name of Jack Bradich, who really goes into um, great detail in his book called um, Conspiracy Panics, and then a subtitle that's kind of long, and I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head in which he really um, explores that question and what counts as a conspiracy theory. And for him, in kind of, in, in my mind, a little bit of an extreme way, he says that the conspiracy theory actually doesn't exist at all, more or less, but it is just a term that is brought up to discredit some forms of knowledge over others. So one of the examples that he really uh, develops is that um, in the case of like black Americans talking about uh, systemic um, violence or something, that kind of knowledge or that that argument is immediately discredited as a conspiracy theory in, in some circles, precisely because it presents a challenge to the status quo. And he gives other examples that like uh, militia groups are, you know, discredited as being conspiracy theorists, even though they have like some legitimacy and he, he gives all these kinds of examples. So this is me saying, I don't actually know. And that it's, it's certainly a question that is uh, up for debate and, and one that different people within the field would certainly, they'd go, they'd rip each other's eyes out, you know, discussing that, that question. Like, should we take a, a, as broad a definition as possible? In which case, to your question, um, if I'm remembering it correctly, there wouldn't really be a distinction between those two things. Whereas some people would take a very specific approach and say that one of those things that is the conspiracy theory is just put forward, or at least the designation of something as a conspiracy theory is just put forward because of the cultural uh, lack of a appreciation of what a conspiracy theory is so it's just a means to disavow that approach but yeah i don't want to ramble on too much with that <laughs> so. yeah there you go yeah yeah yeah. i see see I, I i can see if you type something i can see it for about five seconds and then it goes away so yeah 
Bradditch is great, yeah. Perfect. Um, do we have any other questions or points that want to be raised, perhaps, to give an opportunity to everybody to engage with David? Otherwise, uh, I just want to thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, I had a very specific image of uh, an uncle, you know, with all this kind of crazy theories. So thank you so much for your uh, uh, presentation on conspiracy theories. And conspiracies it was really great. I think it clarified uh, such a timely and important topic, lecture. And so I would also like to uh, say that we also are currently welcoming proposals for the winter 2021 term workshop series from any member of the FIMS and Western communities, students and faculty alike on any work that engages with the rich, diverse and loosely defined disciplines of media and information studies. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending today. And thank you so much, David, for your presentation. It was really, really great and engaging. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for entertaining me.